Hi there everyone, we're back at the Royal Society. I'm again here with Laura and we're going to be looking at some of the Royal Society expedition films and we've got a really exciting one today because we're talking about volcanoes. Yes. We're on a tiny little island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And this is Tristan da Cunha. Tristan da Cunha, yeah. The volcanic island of Tristan da Cunha, often called the loneliest island in the world, rises to a height of nearly 7,000 feet above sea level. It's situated on the southern portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, together with four other volcanic islands. Ascension, St. Helena, Gough, and Bouvet. So one of the things we noticed straight away here, Laura, this is like being like edited and there's narration. This isn't yeah. just like raw footage. What's got, why is that? Uh, so this is one of the Royal Society's big flagship expeditions, really. Um, and because we had this film library at the Royal Society, these films would be made for kind of educational purposes, and this was prime for that. Previously thought to be extinct, Tristan re-erupted in October 1961 on the northwest corner of the island on a low strip of ground close to the village which housed the entire population. There's a couple of hundred people living there. It's a really small population. The British government stepped in, so they still had responsibility for the management of the island. The British Navy comes and sweeps everyone away. It takes them back to the UK. Now, before the scientists got there, we have these restricted messages. They're not that restricted. I think we're allowed to look at this now. <laughs> Basically, what's happening here is there's a Navy ship off the coast watching the volcano and reporting back what's mm. going on. So the original dome appears to have split open with new cone growing in the middle, emitting smoke continuously and flame and incandescent material. Here's a nice little point. They say cattle grazing peacefully at the western end of the yeah, settlement. It's not all bad. So, yeah. so, so the cows are like, oh, yeah. <laughs> got to eat the grass. No problem. All right, <laughs> there we go. After about a week, the volcano's vertical growth slowed up and it started expanding horizontally towards the canning factory on Big Beach. The fishing company decided to try to salvage as much equipment from the factory as possible. Boats were sent ashore to Big Beach just below the canning factory and working under the constant threat of rolling lava blocks from the volcano, a considerable amount of equipment was saved. Towards the end of October, the lava dome breached and a very viscous, blocky lava flow covered the factory and flowed into the sea. So now the scientists are like, enough's enough, yeah. we want some of this action, and the yes. Royal Society decides it's going to send people. So they send in two scientists first as a kind of a pilot mission. So they, with the help of the Navy, they get these two scientists over there just to have a, a little recce and see what the chances are for sending back a bigger expedition a little bit later on. The Royal Society Reconnaissance Party, consisting of two geologists, arrived on board HMS Jaguar. A careful watch was kept, but it was soon obvious that the volcanic activity was entirely confined to the settlement area. OK, so these two scientists that went first, they made some notes and some advice that could be given to the bigger party that mm -hmm. went back, and these make for quite fun mm -hmm. reading. This is his advice to the next round of scientists. Don't worry if this lava still feels hot. It may go on feeling warm for 10 years, and the stuff cools very, very slowly. It doesn't mean anything unless your shoes start smouldering just walk around the hottest spots. Good advice for anyone <laughs> in a volcano. If your shoes start smouldering, that does mean something. Time to worry. Yeah. OK. Valuable information had been gathered by the reconnaissance party, which was of great help in the preparation of a 12-man expedition that the Royal Society was planning to land on the island at the end of January. Laura, when you first saw this footage after it had been sitting on the yeah. shelf for quite a while and you were sitting in a film room, like, what were you thinking when you were seeing this? Yeah, it's quite a thrill. I didn't actually appreciate just how professionally put together they were going to be. Almost as good as James editing on objectivity. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. She didn't agree with me. <laughs> this seems like it was quite risky. Were they worried? Like, was it going to explode again? What were the concerns? Yeah. I mean, it was hugely risky. You don't really see that in the film because they're all very nonchalantly climbing all over the volcano, but it was very dangerous. So this is a document from just before they went over and we've yeah. got an interesting line here. What does this say? There is some small element of danger as the eruption may develop into a violently explosive phase. The risk, however, is a calculated one which any volcanologist would accept. They're hardcore, those volcanologists. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The summit was still very warm, the air temperature being of the order of 130 degrees Fahrenheit, and occasionally it was enveloped in choking sulfurous fumes. 
of course, what was going on with the islanders is another interesting question. And there is a little bit of documentation about that, isn't there, yeah. Laurel? I guess because these people are quite isolated from society, there's yeah. a lot of interest in medical aspects of their life uh -huh. and, and things like that. The dentists seem to be very interested in, yeah. in what they were going on. There were lots of studies of these people's teeth. Obviously, they were looking into things like genetics as well. We see genetic yeah. studies. So it's probably no surprise that the islanders actually did quite want to go back at the end of it actually thank you very much a pilot party went over so about 12 islanders went over just to see like is it okay can we come back and they decided it was safe to go back um, so they had a vote, it went to a vote, and the majority of the islanders were really keen to get back home. There are so many interesting documents and reports about what was mm. going on. I quite like this map here. Oh yeah, there's the factory mm. that got swallowed up. After periods of heavy rain, numerous temporary steam vents occurred all over the lava field. The cattle left on the island after the evacuation had fared well. Although the dogs had run wild and caused some damage, they were not yet hunting as a pack. The sheep had been almost annihilated by the dogs. One last picture as well, which I find quite interesting. This looks like it's a picture of a model. Yeah, so back in London, later that summer, on our summer soiree, the Royal Society put together a lovely little display about Tristan de Cunha, including this lovely model, which I'd quite like for the archive, wherever it is. Where is it? I don't know. We did wonder, maybe they exploded it at the end as kind of a... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> if anyone in any archive anywhere in the UK has seen this, call Laura. She wants it. I want it. Exploded. <laughs> the volcanic island of Tristan da Cunha, often called the loneliest island in the world, rises to a height of nearly 7,000 feet above sea level. First discovered in 1506 by Portuguese navigators, it's situated on the southern portion of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, together with four other volcanic islands. Ascension, St. Helena, Gough, and Bouvet. Also part of the Tristan group are two smaller islands, Nightingale and Inaccessible, some 20 miles to the southwest of the main island. Previously thought to be extinct, Tristan re-erupted in October 1961 on the northwest corner of the island on a low strip of ground close to the village which housed the entire population. The eruption was preceded by two months of local earth tremors and on the 10th of October a small volcanic lava dome of tracheandazite appeared close to the settlement. Due to its proximity to the village, it was decided to evacuate the island. Leaving nearly all their personal belongings behind, the entire population of nearly 300 islanders and Europeans was embarked on two South African crawfishing vessels which regularly fish in Tristan waters. These two vessels, the Francis Repetto and Tristania, then took the islanders to the neighbouring island of Nightingale, where they spent the night. Fortunately, during this period, the weather was extremely fine. The next day, they were embarked on the Royal Interocean Liner Chisadana and taken to South Africa on the first stage of their journey to the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, the volcano had continued to grow and after only four days was 250 feet above ground level. In these early stages, the volcano was in the form of a small lava dome with no visible vent. Although very hot, it was entirely solid, and as it slowly grew, blocks of lava were continually breaking away from its summit. Large quantities of sulfurous fumes were also being evolved, and these proved to be extremely harmful to the vegetation. Among other things, they contained large quantities of sulfur dioxide and hydrogen fluoride. After about a week, the volcano's vertical growth slowed up, and it started expanding horizontally towards the canning factory on Big Beach. The fishing company decided to try to salvage as much equipment from the factory as possible. Boats were sent ashore to Big Beach just below the canning factory and working under the constant threat of rolling lava blocks from the volcano, a considerable amount of equipment was saved. Towards the end of October, the lava dome breached and a very viscous, blocky lava flow covered the factory and flowed into the sea. 
The only film available of these early stages of the eruption was filmed by the first officer of Tristania and unfortunately has had to be enlarged from 8 millimetres. During the next month and a half, the volcano continued to grow unobserved. The first flow continued to expand into the sea and was succeeded by a second and then a third flow. It was while the third flow was actively growing that a Royal Society reconnaissance party consisting of two geologists arrived on board HMS Jaguar. When the island was sighted at dawn on the 16th of December, the volcano was seen to be still active. In spite of heavy seas and a force 6 wind, HMS Jaguar steamed close inshore to obtain a good view of the volcano. However, it was soon obvious that landing a party ashore would be impossible so it was decided to steam slowly around the island to see if there was any activity elsewhere. As the ship swung round to steam past Big Point, the parasitic cinder cone of Big Green Hill, one of many dotted all over the island, was seen perched on the edge of the 2,000-foot sea cliff. This eruption took place approximately 10,000 years ago. A careful watch was kept, but it was soon obvious that the volcanic activity was entirely confined to the settlement area. Next day, the wind and seas had moderated in the vicinity of the settlement. And in order to obtain a better view of the volcano, and in particular of the lava front, which was steaming in the sea, the ship's whaler was launched. The sea was still fairly choppy, but this did not hinder progress towards the actively growing lava flow at the western end of the new lava field. The flow was moving forward at the rate of approximately 20 yards per day and as it had flowed onto the beach and into the sea it was very unlikely to affect the settlement which so far had been spared destruction. The lava front was of no great thickness and consisted of a rubbly mass of hot solid lava blocks. The huge quantities of steam being given off were simply caused by the vaporization of seawater and should not be confused with the sulfurous fumes being emitted by the volcano. The central portion of the lava field was very much cooler and only small quantities of steam were being evolved. It dropped nearly sheer into the sea, which at this point was nearly 50 feet deep. The height of the lava above sea level was 20 to 30 feet, making the total thickness of the flow nearly 80 feet. Always dominant in the background was the main volcanic cone. Close to, the rubbly and blocky nature of the lava field became very apparent. Periodically, from behind the volcanic cone, mushroom-shaped clouds of volcanic gases and dust were hurled into the air. Blocks of lava and bombs were also thrown out at this stage. The extreme eastern end of the lava field was even cooler than the central portion. Steam was almost entirely absent and it was only the heat haze over the lava field that indicated recent activity. Unfortunately, time was running out and the whaler had to return to HMS Jaguar. However, valuable information had been gathered by the reconnaissance party which was of great help in the preparation of a 12-man expedition that the Royal Society was planning to land on the island at the end of January. HMS Jaguar then returned to Cape Town and the volcano was again unobserved for nearly six weeks. During this time, the third lava flow continued to grow. However, the growth of the lava field had stopped 
by the time the Royal Society expedition to Tristan da Cunha arrived on the 27th of January aboard the South African frigate Transvaal. Fortunately, as far as could be seen, the village in which the expedition hoped to set up base was still intact. After two days' delay due to bad weather conditions, boats were lowered and the expedition's equipment was ferried ashore and landed in the lee of the lava field just below the settlement. Base camp was set up in the administrator's house and very soon the scientific program, which included geological, botanical and zoological aspects, was being planned in detail. And the lava comes through there. The house commanded an excellent view of the volcanic cone and the lava field so that it was under more or less constant observation. Of prime importance was the study of the new eruption. Viewed from the bottom of the cliffs behind the volcano, the details of the lava field and the volcanic cone soon became evident. The central and highest portion of the volcanic cone was almost entirely shrouded by sulfurous fumes, but at the back of the volcano a small cinder cone or vent was seen. This cinder cone was the source of the explosive activity witnessed by the reconnaissance party. Features such as these were duly recorded and mapped by the geologists. In the vicinity of the cinder cone, sulphurous fumes percolated through the lava fragments and deposited fumarolic minerals which, when conditions permitted, were collected. The two commonest minerals found were white gypsum, a hydrated calcium sulphate, and yellow sulphur, seen sparkling in this specimen. In the centre of the volcanic cone was an elongated ridge of lava which marked the source of the lava flows. Initially this was extremely hot, but towards the beginning of March a party managed to climb it to investigate the red glow seen in some deep crevasses on its summit. The slopes consisted of unstable blocks of lava and great care had to be taken to avoid rock falls. The summit was still very warm, the air temperature being of the order of 130 degrees Fahrenheit and occasionally it was enveloped in choking sulphurous fumes. The village could be seen below, but the details were obscured by the heat haze. The red glow was observed in a long crack about one foot wide and eight feet deep and although the material was extremely hot, it was solid and not liquid. The temperature of the material was measured with an optical pyrometer, an instrument used extensively for measuring temperatures in blast furnaces, and also with a thermocouple and potentiometer. The temperature was found to be 890 degrees centigrade. Viewed from above, the lava field resembled a huge mass of rubble. The individual fragments of lava ranged in size from that of a telephone box to that of a pea. Already the sea was forming beaches around the edge of the lava field as the rubbly nature of the lava made it especially prone to erosion. And during the expedition's seven-week stay on the island, this headland was cut back some 20 feet. Visitors to the island in October 1962 found that beaches had formed along most of the lava front. After periods of heavy rain, numerous temporary steam vents occurred all over the lava field. 
These, however, were different in character from the permanent fumaroles, such as this one, which, besides water vapour, contained other volcanic gases similar to those being evolved from the main vent. Fortunately, the majority of the lava flowed away from the village. There was, however, some damage done to the village, but only of a minor nature. During the period of earth tremors preceding the eruption, many water pipes were distorted and bent out of the ground. Fortunately, the spring, which supplied the village with water, was still flowing. The only damage to any of the houses was to the one which happened to be nearest to the volcanic cone. This was unfortunately completely burnt out. It was set on fire by several extremely hot blocks of lava, one of which is seen here, which were blown out of the volcano and fell onto the thatched roof. Similar blocks were found abundantly near the volcanic cone. They were very scoriaceous and friable and could easily be broken in the hand. More often than not, they had broken into several fragments on impact with the ground. The intensity of the fire must have been very considerable. Various everyday articles littered the floor, bottles and spoons and so on. By the door was the remains of a pushchair, and in the gable wall was a cooking stove. The path that used to lead from the village to the canning factory was completely cut off by a hundred foot wall of lava. About a hundred yards below the path towards the sea was the site where an old cannon and flagpole used to be, just above the headland called Julia Point. The flagpole was only just spared destruction, and when the expedition arrived, a tattered Union Jack was flying from its peak. Partially covered by lava blocks was the cannon, which was probably a relic from the garrison sent to the island in 1816. The cattle left on the island after the evacuation had fared well. Although the dogs had run wild and caused some damage, they were not yet hunting as a pack, and only young calves had suffered. The sheep had been almost annihilated by the dogs. But donkeys were still in their former numbers. Chickens too had somehow survived in spite of the dogs and the large number of cats. Besides studying the domestic animals, the zoologist made collections of insects from the vicinity of the new volcano with a view to ascertaining the effect of the volcanic activity on the natural fauna of the island. The botanist dug soil profiles before setting up permanent quadrats in order to ascertain the redevelopment of the vegetation. The vegetation was affected by the volcano in various ways. Close to the lava field was a small patch of flax which showed signs of having been badly scorched and set on fire. Further away in the village, canna lilies were blooming normally in the gardens. Close to the volcano, the natural vegetation was badly affected by the poisonous volcanic fumes. The fronds of the dwarf tree fern, Blechnum palmiforme, were badly damaged. Fortunately, the injury was not permanent, and new green fronds were appearing. The island tree, Phylica arborea, was also affected.
The damage to the dwarf tree ferns and island tree was confined mainly to the sea cliffs and a narrow strip of ground above them and extended round the island to Sandy Point, a distance of nearly six miles to the east of the volcano, that is, on the downwind side. The rest of the natural vegetation, however, was only seriously damaged very close to the volcano. Apart from the field work, there were specimens to be labelled and registered, and altogether nearly three quarters of a ton of rock specimens were collected from 686 localities. These were carefully packed away in boxes in readiness for the expedition's departure scheduled for the end of March aboard HMS Protector. There were also field notes to be written up and preliminary reports prepared. The geological mapping of the island was completed a few days before HMS Protector arrived and early on the morning of the 20th of March 1962 her helicopter began ferrying the expedition's equipment, specimens and personnel from shore to ship. This task was completed in two hours. Viewed from the air, the volcano was seen in true perspective as a relatively small outpouring of lava on the flanks of a huge volcanic pile. Only six months after the volcano first appeared, nearly all active growth had ceased and the eruption was virtually over. All that remained for the geologists was laboratory work. For biologists, however, the recovery of the damaged flora and colonisation of the new lava will be a source of interest for many years.